Good afternoon, I am Pete, also known as Risk for Rewards, or over on Twitter, at Risk for Rewards. Got over 15,000 followers over there, and over 1,000 here on YouTube. And I am here to preview the Wednesday of the Cheltenham Festival. If you're wondering why I look the same as Tuesday, it's because I've done back-to-back previews. The reason for that is because we've got the declarations just in just now, so I can do both of them now. Um... So you may be listening to this after my day one, thinking that guy got everything wrong on day one. I'm not listening to him. So that's fair enough, but there's not a lot I can do about that. So we are on to Cheltenham Wednesday. And I'm just going to give you a quick fire through. As I went with the Tuesday, if you've watched Tuesday's video, I went into a quite a bit of depth through strategies and back plans and bits and bobs. So I'm just going to give a quick summary of three points that are on my blog. If you haven't seen my blog, my blog is over on Twitter. It is uh, it's currently on my profile. It will be pinned to my profile by tomorrow. Um, and it's got over 40,000 words. It covers 28 races. It covers pointers. It's got 2024 um, uh, horses you might want to select and everything you want for the Cheltenham Festival. Whether you know nothing about racing or you think you know everything about racing, I like to think there's something on there for everyone. It has took 10 weeks of my time. Um, but I just hope that people enjoy it and it is free for anyone. But I'm just going to quickly tap on three things. My three pointers are have a plan. So I put this out on Sunday. Obviously, this video is going to be going out on Monday. So plan your plan your week out for the festival. Work out your best bets and work backwards from that. Don't wait till Thursday or Friday. Realize that's the best day to punt and you've already spent all your money. Um, point two was you can back more than one horse in a race. Don't let anyone tell you any different. If you really fancy two horses at three to one and uh, you can't work out between which one, don't end up uh, trying to guess and go in and end up losing minus two points when you could pick both. And uh, yeah, it's a smaller profit at even money, but at the end of the day, a winner is a winner. And it's not just three to one shots. You could back a five to two shot and I don't know, a, a three to one shot. And yeah, it'll be slightly odds on, but it's better to get an odds on winner than it is to have a loser at the end of the day. And point three is I do not get paid. I have had affiliates contact me, but I do not have any affiliations with anything. Therefore, a lot of people have been nice enough to drop me a fiver for a, for a pint for all the content I've provided in the last year and also for the Cheltenham Festival blog, which is much appreciated. And I really appreciate that from everybody. And if you do want to do that, my PayPal link is connected to the blog over on Twitter. And I thank you in advance for that if that is the case, if you are one of those kind people. So thank you very much. OK, quick intro done. And we are now a quick flick. The Cheltenham Festival guide has now been up for 20 hours and we've got 5,328 views already considering last year only had 14,000 in the whole week I'd be pretty sure that we're going to be much closer to probably 40 to 50,000 this week with the mass of followers we've got over here and over there anyway no one really cares about that they just want winners so we are on to the Wednesday I currently look out I live around an hour away from Cheltenham and it is throwing it down with rain so we are looking at potentially soft ground currently and with the rain coming in, I'd say we're probably going to start on soft tomorrow. It may dry out a little bit. It's probably going to be around the soft. I wouldn't have thought we'll get good in the title, especially in the first two days. So therefore, on to the Ballymore we go. Anyone who's followed Antipost, I know obviously this is primarily for fresh selections because a lot of people won't have followed Antipost. But I'm just going to quickly run through for this race specifically for the Antipost people. Obviously, we had Faso Vega, the short price for the Supreme. So I just left that race completely in the Ballymore. I tried targeting every horse I could at bigger prices before they won. So looking through this market, we've got Champ Kylie at 50 to 1. So 5-0 to 1. Um, we've got Goodland at either 32 or 36 to 1. Um, we've got Hermes Allen at 18 to 1. And obviously, a few days ago, I said to add Impair a pass at 3 to 1. So if you look at that, we've got prices of 3 to 1, 18 to 1, 36 to 1 and 50 to 1. And the only horse that's less than 22 to 1 left is Gaelic Warrior. So if you're on anti-post, obviously the only other horse I mentioned to add was Impere Pass. And the people are looking at me saying you can't back four horses in a race. If you can't work out how you can back those four horses at those prices and make a profit, then I don't think horse racing betting is really for you. You should probably just watch it and enjoy it. Um, you can make a profit and you can make quite a big one at that. Um, however, obviously, the fly in the ointment is Gaelic Warrior. So let's start with him. As I look on Racing Post, he's been jocked up. He's got Patrick Mullins on board. And he's actually the only one who's got three tips at the moment. Um, so Gaelic Warrior, 
I can understand everything about liking this horse. He reminds me, it's probably just the colours, but he's very much like the Duvan Vitor mould and the way he travels um, very strongly, big, strong traveller. Um, the downside is for me is that he got beat in a handicap off at this track last year, 11 pounds lower against Brazil. Brazil's no world beater. Um, and obviously he was getting he was getting weight for the majority of the field that day, and he was well in because obviously he's won a handicap at the Dublin Race Festival since. And it was his jumping right that let him down. And here we have again, he's going to be jumping right. So he's not only going to have to be at least group one level, he's going to have to probably be at least five lengths better than this lot in order to be able to afford those jumping frailties. Unless he manages to put in an unblemished perfect round. But I do remember we had this situation a few years ago with Asteria Falange and the Supreme. And they were like, oh, we'll just put a stable mate alongside him and that will sort him out. They put a stable mate alongside him and he ended up wiping both of them out. And they both went. So I don't think Gaelic Warrior will fall, but his jumping turn. I can tell you now, other jockeys, so the likes of Harry Cobden, um, Mikey O'Sullivan, Danny Mullins, Paul Townend, like, they're not going to be sacrificing their chance. So it, regardless of what they're told to do stable duty-wise, if you're below a 10 to 1 shot in the Ballymore, you are not going to be sitting there trying to help your stable mate jump straight and keep him covered up. They're going to be running their own race. So that for me is a concern. And whether it's the, and the, the biggest concern is the running. Like at the time, he, when he hit the hill last year, he was still swinging on the bridle and you thought, how far? But when he started coming down the hill, he's, the jumping got worse. And by the time he got to the thing, he was over on the rail where all the fans are. So unless they end up coming down that right-hand side rail, um, that would suit him because obviously he can't jump into, well, he could jump into the crowd, but it's not likely, then he is going to be well over the track and giving lengths away for fun. So that's purely why. If he if he wins, then obviously it's one of those. I've had a perfect anti-post book. I could back him still and make profit. This is what I'm saying about you should definitely be able to. I could back him still and make profit, but I don't see him as the horse, as the threat. Like I just, well, of course he's a threat, but at the same time, if he wins, I'll just take it on the chin. I'd expect, I'd hope one of the front four, the other four are going to win. Um, just from the others, others uh, American Mike is now in at 40 to 1. I've not been impressed with anything I've seen this year. If they do this, this would be like an, a massive, crazy performance because I've seen nothing this year over hurdles. It would say to me, he's anything like the horse that finished second in the um, champion bumper and the way his bumper runs were last year. Um, and the rest of them are group one winners. The other thing to note with Gaelic Warrior, going back to that, sorry, is the fact that he won that handicap. He looked really good on the day when the handicap. But everyone saw how fast Vega ran, blew up, finished lame, ended up pretty much pulled up but passed the line. Fasal Vega, despite all the things that he did wrong, still finished in front of Gaelic Warrior. I know the handicap and the two-mile novice race would be ran completely different. But at the same time, he's still finished in front of him. I think Gaelic Warrior would have had a huge chance in the Supreme and that would have suited him a lot better. The fast pace, everyone in a big bundle. I think the fact of going at a slower, sedater pace and then quickening off. Because this is another thing, going to the Ballymore, everyone thinks that the longer the distance, the, the difference in the race is, like the Supreme, like it's a big sprint because it's a short, but it's actually the opposite way around. The Supreme is a stamina test. They go from the off and they go and see who can go for as, as long as they can, the fastest. The Ballymore is actually the sprint. The Ballymore, even though it's a longer trip, they go a sedate pace all the way around and then they quicken off. The pace slowly gets bigger and bigger and then they go off the fast pace and then they try and burn off the rest of their rivals. So I thought Gaelic Warrior was perfect the other race, but regardless, I don't like him because of his jumping. Champ Kylie. I think Champ Kylie is one of those that, if you're on at the big price, 50 to 1, perfect. But 8 to 1, I think he's pretty tough to back. He's a hardy horse. He'll be up there in the front. Um, uh, he has looked, that they've said that he needed at least two mile four or further. So the soft ground is going to suit him. Um, he's got Danny Mullins, who's obviously a wizard, and especially from the front. So he's not one you want to live. And he, he does like a fight and a battle. Obviously, he's seen him off in, in his in his um, fight most recently um, <clears throat> when beating Irish Point, who seems to be the stalwart that everyone beats in their group ones. Um, but I just think there could be a couple too good for him. Good land, hard to knock with anything that he's done so far. Um, obviously, Barry O'Connell just thinks he's going to win everything um, and his horses are miles better than everyone else's. The downside for Goodland is I backed him at the DRF. I thought that was a perfect run. When he hit the front, pulled clear. I just expect him to continue to pull clear. My concern was he didn't really. And whether that was by design, they didn't want to give him too hard a race or that was as good as he got. But they began to catch up a little bit and like those horses that were catching up were for me three mile horses so you've got the likes of absolute lotions sandor again and cool survivor those three will all be albert bartlett horses so it was two mile six furlongs um and he did it he did it very well on the day but my argument would be is the fact that he was beating horses that in effect aren't horses that are going to quicken off a pace which he did he led from the front quickened off a pace and went away 
And it was a, it was a good ride because obviously he, he took the sting out of him and got away from him without making it too much of a stamina test. My concern again would be for him is that I just think he might bump into two that are, that are better horses than him. And going on to my prime example from earlier mentioned about backing multiple horses in a race, obviously with my anti-post, I don't need to think about this, but for people backing multiple horses, I wouldn't put you off trying to find a way to back these front two in the market. Like it wouldn't surprise me if Hermes Allen goes off seven to two, four to one, and Imperi pass two to one, five to two, and you can couple them up and it and it ends up paying like around evens. At the market, at the moment, the market's still very raw, so you're looking at like around two to one Imperi pass and about seven to two um, Hermes Allen. Um, but by the time all this rain stopped, the first day stopped, like the the, the markets are going to move. And Perry Pass was three to one about four days ago. It's only because of a few previews that he's gone in. So the bookmakers, they've all declared, like all the big guns have declared, so it may well drift back out. I just think these are very difficult to split. Hermes Allen, unfortunately for him, has the negatives of the Chalo, much like Brave Man's game, the zero for 18 stat. If Demon couldn't do it, no one could do it. However, the massive positive on his side is when people have been saying that in the past, the ground's been okay. At the moment, it's still raining outside. It's soft currently. And I don't think it's going to go like soft or heavy. But when he won that cello, it was on soft ground. And if he turns up and it's on soft, like as in decent soft ground, um, that you're going to get your toe in proper and he goes off in front, I think that's going to play to his strengths. And while you would argue the cello winners, you look at the way the races ran, it's more like an Albert Bartlett. It just, he just outstayed the lot rather than quickening off a pace. And, and that could well be the case if the ground ended up very soft for him. Um, I just think just because of a stat, you can't argue, you can't say like that he definitely can't win. Um, and I do think he will drift to a backable price because of that exact factor. Um, he's obviously won at Cheltenham, but beating the likes of Music Drive isn't much form, but at least you know he handles the course. Um, but it, the thing that does it for me is his jumping. His jumping is just as, same with many of Nichols. They're, he's electric at his hurdles. Like, and that's the difference to what separates him from Gaelic Warrior. Gaelic Warrior might have a lot more class and is currently rated seven pounds higher than him. And you could say that that's more than fair. But the issue is, is that when Hermes Allen is going straight as a die and literally just clipping the top of each hurdle, Gaelic Warrior is going out and he's also going wide. So, like, I just think he's just such a good jumper that's going to keep him in his race. The, the downside is going from the front. Is he going to be able to quicken as well as some of the others rather than stay on? I also think that it's not the end of the world for them, whether he's going up to three mile hurdles or whether it's three mile chaser next year. Um, he's getting pigeonholed in the brave man's game sort of mold but i think that's just because of the paul nichols sort of thing and you know he's going to be a great chaser a good jumper and all the works but i think from what you've seen you can't say he can't win which is why you you have got those two at the front end of the market and then imperia pass is unfortunately been subject to the 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 good chat as in you listen to people this morning and all the way through the week and david casey just is, is waxing lyrical who's uh, works obviously heavily in the willie mullins yard and there's so many good things coming out about this horse and i thought originally i got it pointed out to me from a friend over christmas period because his debut went under just completely unseen um, and it wasn't until it, at Punchestown when he was declared for the moscow flyer that people started to take note and i mentioned him quite heavily that week in the build-up um and i thought his he was better in his two mile three furlongs, despite it being a weaker field, just the way he was exactly what you'd see in a Ballymore horse. As in, they toodled round. They did skip the last, which was, wasn't was great, but they toodled round. And then when he pushed the button to quicken, he quickened and he was gone. And that was it. It was like, see you later. Um, this is my race to win. And the massive positive for him is that was on soft ground and his win in the Moscow Flower was on heavy ground. So it was in terrible ground and they did plod around that race as well. And you could argue like the, the field were trying to get away from him and it was like, a, is he going to go? But he just, again, he's just such a good jumper. Very, very slick at his hurdles. Doesn't miss a beat. Um, strong traveller and he just quickened away. And I personally, I know obviously I could be saying this and then everyone's thinking I'm stupid because Fasal Vega could have already won. I think he's their best novice hurdler. Obviously, by the time you watch this, Fasal Vega may as well have, or may have, or LHA Tom may have bolted up in the Supreme, but this is just my personal view. And with Willie's record in the races like this and the way they can split them, he's been very strong that Fasal Vega stays supreme and Imperi Pass stays in the Ballymore. So he, for me, if you can only have one bet, it would be Imperi Pass. But I'm very attached to the Hermes Allen and I don't believe in this whole like brave man's game sort of you can't win it sort of thing, mainly because of the conditions. If it was good ground, I think I'd be leaning strongly on Imperi Pass, even though he's more his last two runs are on soft and heavy. But I just think because of the ground, I think that is going to bring stamina into it. And that whole two mile four then starts to bring out two mile six. And it and the front two, if Hermes Allen's leading or something like Imperi Pass is sat behind, 
before you know it, Hermes Allen could be skipping few away from a few of these. And like I said, you will get like drifts. The bookmakers want to take you on as much as you want to take them on. So don't be like, oh no, everyone's took the prices seven to four crash dive in. Like if you miss a price on a horse, it is what it is. But generally, a lot of these horses, like like the likes prime example, Fasal Vega declared yesterday two to one. You now look at the market; he's eleven to four. Come the morning tomorrow, he could be anywhere between five to two and seven to two. And then you start thinking he's backable. Imperial Pass is fifteen to eight. I'd be shocked if some point, yeah, okay, there's a lot of stable chatter, so it may not be as likely. But you could well end up with bookies boost, or just generally that he's like two to one, five to two, and then he's an easy play to put in Hermes Allen, or if you want to, Imperi for the win and Hermes for a cover bet. But those two are the ones for me. Yeah, it's obvious. Okay, everyone's saying, oh, yeah, nice one, mate. You took the front two of the market, but. I'm just giving you my opinion. It's harder for me to put these videos out because obviously I've got a lot of these anti posts. So it's a bit different when I'm putting horses that up at short prices, but I've already backed them. So for me, Imperi Pass and Hermes Allen. Right, on to the Brown Advisory. I'll keep this one short and sweet. We have got Time Hill on anti post, but for me personally, the more the closer we get to the race, the more I'm going off him. I think. If he's there coming to two or three out, then he's got a massive chance. The issue is, will his jump and hold for long enough for him to be there? He's had three runs. Uh, one run on debut, he was okay. Run two, he was awful, but it was just his class that kept him in amongst and looked fabulous. And then at race three at Kempton in the quarter star, he was okay. He's what I'd say efficient at a, at a fence rather than being good. He's not gaining ground, but he's not losing ground anymore. Whereas on his second run, he was literally losing ground at every, every single fence. The old snooker table analogy. Um, he is the, the negative for him is that he, I haven't got the stat, but basically if you've stayed for longer than one season over hurdles, it's a huge negative. And he put three seasons over um, hurdles but obviously he was in the stairs hurdles he was finishing placed in the stairs hurdle he finished placed in the albert bartlett i think he finished fourth actually um he is a monster stayer and if this comes into a staying test especially on soft ground it's going to suit him down to the ground my issue is will he be quick enough both through the air and traveling in between to stay in the race until it gets to that point he may well be and he's now at 15 to 2 might be a fair price to try but i just think there's others that could be stronger um, adamantly chosen has been running some like he's as an 18 to one shot like i would not write him off because he's been running some good races behind the, the other market leaders like mighty potter and jerry Colon. so he's he's a good outsider galia de la toe finished pulled up behind time hill but time hill was on a going day galia toe wasn't and then galia de la toe next time out was on a going day against opposition and, and beat them I think even with the mayor's allowance i think she's up against it i know people have said skelton that's skelton's best chance of the week but He's not really going to t- tell you if he's got a handicapper that he thinks well handicapped because one that he could have connections or people who own the horse and stuff that want to get their own money on, and two, it's just not in his nature. He might tell you, oh, it's got a good chance five minutes before, um, whereas this is a graded race. So, to me, could she win? Maybe, but I just think this is this is definitely a step too far for me personally. So Joe Hard, obviously, I backed the Turners. That was one of the slips in the bin. But even if he'd come to the Turners, I'd still find it hard to see him winning here. Like Willie Mullins has mentioned the fact that they're going slower here. They're going three miles. Um, so he'd have a, he'll have he'll have a better chance um, finding his feet and the jumping and his lack of experience may not count as it. Like you're going to have horse in here like the real whacker who's literally going to ping every single fence and meet it beautifully. And if, if you're not jumping to a similar sort of level to him or even jumping efficiently, he will just take lengths out of you. And that's a danger for obviously other horses like Time Hill and the like. Like he would just ping, 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 ping. And it doesn't matter if he's the best horse in the race, he would just take lengths out of them. And that'd be my fear for Sir Gerhard because he was a bit sticky at his first view and he, he warmed the race, but that was a two runner affair. And he got up to win, but I don't think the horse he was against was overly that overly bothered about um trying to win anyway. Um so I just think it's a huge ask, like monumental. Like I think he would have gone champion hurdle if there wasn't a constitution hill and Willie didn't have state man. Um, I just think he sees no point in trying to go in there and try and dip that that market. Um, and I just think if he wins, then fair play. His class has just gotten through it and he's putting an impeccable display. But on second start, I said this last year that before um, Bob Ollinger raced against Galloping Deschamps, I wrote in the blog that both of these two are coming in with two novice chase starts. And it worries me that it's now becoming common that they're coming here on the third start. It's not an easy track to handle in a championship pace, championship level. And obviously he's coming in on the second start. And if there wasn't an obvious front runner and it was like quite a low key like sort of race, then it'd be fair enough. But the real whacker is going to go from the front and he's going to ping every fence. 
So he's going to play catch me if you can. And if and if that if you're not good enough, you will not keep up. And that's what would be my concern with Sergio Hard. One start is not enough in the novice chase. He could well win, and obviously that would be his class because he obviously he was first or second in the champion bumper. He won the um Brown uh, the Ballymore last year, but for me you're taking a big chance. And I'd understand if it was at a good price, but he's second favourite. He sat there at five to one, so he's not for me. Um, so that just leaves to Jerry Colomb. Um, originally this was by default of the fact that uh, he was five to two, and I thought the race would cut up. But now the race has actually got plenty of runners in it, and it's a bit like an old school Brown advisory. And I think to win these sort of races, you need to have experience. And you look at Jerry clom has got three runs. Real Wacker's got two. Dalia de has got three. Time Hill's got three. And I think that extra run will make the difference. The thing with Jerry Colom is he's been campaigned at a short trip all season. There seems to be this thing where it's proper. he's a proper Marmite horse. People either love him or they're really not fussed about him. Whereas for me, I think he's the most obvious winner or the most likely winner but I'm not like in love with him. I'm not going around saying he's my nap, like I cannot see him beat. I've come across him because I, by default. So like if I summarise what I've just said about the fact that, well, going to Jerry Colomb, I just think his sand down run was brilliant in showing his attitude. I don't think the horses he beat there were particularly brilliant, but he was well beaten at one step. Not well beaten, but he was looking beat over two mile four and it was fast enough, but he just found more and he met the last two fences on a perfect stride and he just won and going away. And that's what you want in this race because you need to have experience. And if three of these come down, because this isn't going to be, I can't imagine that this is going to be the, whatever the ground is. I can't imagine one horse is just going to win this by like 10 lengths. So coming down that hill, there's going to be like two or three of them probably all going in for those last two, uh, two fences. And if you've got any sort of frailties in your jumping, um, they will be exposed. Whereas Jerry Colomb really came up in the last two for Jordan Gainford. He said, I, I am willing to put my all in. And that was over two mile four. So I just think this three mile or suit, and he looks a potential gold cup horse. Um, and and then the other one I haven't discussed is the real whacker. Real whacker is for me, he's perfect each way. John and each way, but I can't see him out of frame. I just think he could find one or two of class above him, but at the same time he may not. Um the, the reason I think that he could have is because despite his his best form was the two mile four came back really well on the sectionals. But he went toe to toe with Indigo Breeze throughout the whole race at Cheltenham. Um and that, that was a big run in itself. But when he got when he got round to the three miles, Indigo Breeze was travelling all over him odds on to, to beat him um but he just kept finding more meeting every fence like perfect stride perfect stride but you've got to think that indigo breeze wouldn't be in gordon elliott's top 10 two mile four to three mile horses whereas jerry colomb would be in probably his top three um so you think that, he, that indigo breeze has probably got about 20 pound to find on a horse like jerry colomb so the fact that he only beat him that day by three quarters of a length off level weights like that form line just says to me. And the other race that he won was two mile four against Mon Morale. Now, as we've seen, like he's Mon Morale has just not turned out to be the chaser a lot of people thought he could be. So I just don't think the form's there. I think he's got the attributes for it, as in if no one else comes to him, he will go out, he will jump, and he will. That's why he's the perfect each way bet if you if you want, if you're that way inclined. But Jerry Colomb is currently priced at um, seven to four. But I could easily see, even though the soft ground's arrived, I think he'll sit there at 74 for now. It wouldn't surprise me if on the day, because this is fairly competitive and behind, that he begins to drift. Like So, <clears throat> Time Hill's thrown in a wobbly once. Galia de la Toe's thrown in a wobbly once. Sir Gerard's only had one run over fences. Um, so, there's plenty of question marks about their jumping. So, the real whack is the solid one, but I just think Jerry Colomb's got the class. Um, and I, I'm not one of those, like, as in, there's people that have napped this as their nap of the week. That's that's not for me. But I do think he will win. Um, and I think it'll be a brilliant race as well, because I think the way um, the real whack will go off in front, I think it will be a brilliant race. Um, the next race is the Coral Cup, of which I picked a few out, but unfortunately one's not been declared, no ordinary Joe. The only horse I've got at the moment is San Salvador. It'd be easier if you just read my blog, because it'll take me ages to go through all the handicapping form. But long and short is that I think that Joseph O'Brien's a good uh, tactical um, uh, target trainer of handicap hurdles. Um, I think he's been laid out for this. He's got form on soft and heavy ground. He's got in off a good weight. Um, and he's 20, 25 to 1. So what price is he actually? Just to not fill you up. San Salvador. Oh, 18 to 1, sorry. But again, all these prices, especially on exchanges and stuff, come the day, they're all going to, a lot of them may well get bigger. Let the exchange be your friend as well. Right, on to the Queen Mother Chairman Chase. This is very difficult for me to nail my colours down to the mast um, because of the weather. Um, <clears throat> short version, uh, Green Nateen had his chances, nine-year-old now. 
Um, I think he's better on tracks like Sandown. I think he ran too big a race in the Holden Gold Cup, which is why he was a bit flat despite finishing second to Edward Stone, which was good on the form lines, but he was well beaten by that rival. I think he's better than that. He was very flat last time out, which is why I think this time he'd be a better horse because I think he runs a flat run, then he runs a good run. So I wouldn't surprise to see him, but I think he'll he'll finish in front of Nuba Negro, who I could not have at all. Um, horse had its... They're like, oh, well, he went so close in the champion chase. I mean, he, he came second in the champion chase that was his his one chance to win because Shaq and Poissois never run this his best race over away from Ireland and he finished third and um, put the kettle on won that race so I don't think he's got it in him and I and, and again he's he's been beaten so many times by different horses and he's been be- he's already been beaten by Editor G um, and Greener Team multiple times and Politolog Chuck and Boswell he's been beaten by everyone so without being horrible to him I don't get where people are getting the angle for him Editor G especially now the fact that have we still got eight runners one two three four five six or oh, there's only seven runners now so I don't know what the bookmakers will pay, whether they'll still pay eight runners, but he's the knock in each way, but obviously at five to one, there's no, I can't see the front three not finishing in the front three. Um, for number, Savola obviously will enjoy the ground, um, but Editor G has been brilliant. He's improved out of all recognition and he's got the dodging bullets effect. And what I mean by that is I remember the year when we had the likes of, I can't remember what it was, Underso and another horse. And they were like, they were doing exactly what Enigamine and Edwardstone were doing in the fact that, They'd been beaten by the solid horse in Dodging Bullets. Dodging Bullets won all the trials and was beating horses like Edward Stone and Lennon Jermaine. And then on the day, everyone was like, yeah, but the form will get reversed, the form will get reversed. And it didn't. Dodging Bullets won and, and won the champion chase. It was a massive shock to me. Um, but he beat horses like under so that everyone expected to reverse the form. So it would not be a shock whatsoever if this was similar here where everyone's expecting Editor G to get the form turned around and he just does it once more. Um, uh, however... He's a brilliant each way bet, and if you're like a punter who wants to have a flyer at that, he'll give you a good run for his money, especially because obviously he'll go off from the front. But I just think the soft ground is going to bring the other two into it massively. Uh, I was very lukewarm on Enigamine, but his form from last year, obviously on heavy ground on that massive deluge and on soft ground generally, is is better than his good ground, and he's he's a different horse on it. Um, it's not that other horses don't handle in it. I just think he improves for it. He really enjoys it. He was very fresh last time out. Um, the issue was that obviously Willie talked about it being the white fences and uh, stuff like that. I mean, I hope that's not going to be a thing because otherwise we're going to have issues all the way through the week because there's going to be plenty of horses that haven't seen the white fences. Um, and he was well beaten, to be fair. There was no argument with it um, in the Cheltenham trial in January. Um, like you could argue Edwardson and Editor Jeep could have swapped form, but Enigamin was well beaten. He travelled well, he jumped well, um, he almost over-travelled and he was over-jumping, he was jumping into back arrivals. Why they didn't take a pull and go round to make your ground? Obviously, easy to say now in hindsight, but I think Townend, if he's doing that again, he'll get much closer to Edith de Gilles and just let him get right up on his tail. The thing for me is like he's just such a like a very good horse, like a good jumper, top, top level. Um and I do think it wouldn't surprise me if both the front two reverse the form with Editor G as in they sit on his tail this time. I think Enigamine means a much stronger traveller. Um, and in the soft ground, he, he's going to relish it. Um, and the jumping he'll enjoy. But he did clatter the last and he looked well beaten by Edward Stone. At the time when they went to the last, um, Tom Cannon was looking across to see how much Paul Town had. And, he, and it looked like he didn't have a lot anyway, even if he'd met the last well. Um, and then Edward Stone, he pushed the button way too late. And obviously he had to make up plenty of ground at the hardest part of the race to make it. And then obviously he headed to the G. He just once headed, he then fought back again because he had left. He had some left. Um, he looked through this field and there's every chance that he could get not a soft lead, but still a softish lead. Now a gentleman to me is out. Um, Captain Guinness may pester him out in front, but I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how much of a lead he gets. Um, so bottom line is obviously one will depend on the rain. Like If it, the rain starts hammering down still and you're going towards heavy ground, um, and then Gamine uh, is around the 7-4, to 2-1 to one mark. Maybe he's the bet. But currently, he's sat at soft. Like, you look at Edward Stone's form, he's still got good ground. Uh, he's still got good form in, on soft ground all the way through. And the way he found, I just think they've been bringing him slowly along and he's had his issues. And he's actually had valid mistakes, uh, valid issues for his other runs. And I think he's the one to be on at 6-4 to four or 7-4. to four. Um, I just think he's the... Well, he's got everything in his favour in the stats world as well. And the fact that uh, Willie Mullins has only won the Champion Chase once. That was last year, obviously. Um, and also reoccurring 
champion chase horses is so rare to come by. Like the only two in recent years is uh, Altior and Masterminded, both of which weren't, I th- they scrambled home the second year compared to their first year. Um, even horses like the best of my generation, Sprinter Sacra, he couldn't manage to do it. He regained the title four years later, but they, he didn't go back to back. Um, it's very difficult for whatever reason to keep two mile champion chasers at the top level for that period of time. So he's got that against him. And if you look at the Arkle figures, I haven't got them to hand, but it's literally like horses that have gone from the Arkle to the champion chase forming the champion chase is like one, 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 two, one, 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 two, one, one, two, one, like that's in, they go very close. So I think if you were looking for the solid one, I think Edward Stone will run his race and be first or second, but it would not surprise me if Edward Stone beats Anna Kameen here. Um, right then, moving on. So another race, which is very, dependent on ground like i'm looking through now and it's, they've got a big field for this like a really big field apologies yeah there's a really really big field so it's going to be plenty of basically you're going to want to be prominent because you're not going to want to be um knocked down if something falls or gets in your way or whatever because obviously at the end of the day cross country chase is a unique specialist track but it's like an obstacle course many of these won't have even won't have even gone around but you've got the likes of Franco de Port, eight, 8 to 1. I mean, I don't know where you're getting that from. Patrick Mullins is riding as well, which is very unlike him. So for me, you you look at, I, I just think that this is between the t- front two in the market. Like horse like back on the lash are good horses, but they were getting in these handicaps, they're getting like two stone off that work. They're not getting that here. Two stone is a lot to be given for a few lengths. And again, this is exactly the same. This is why I was a bit reluctant to put this video out, but I'll be at Cheltenham tomorrow, so I have no choice, is the ground. Like if you're looking at the ground, come to come to the Wednesday and you're looking at soft or even soft or heavy, like that's Delta Works bag. He is all over there. We saw it last year when he beat Tiger Roll in a horrible circumstances. Um and he got up on the line. I mean, he was he did something that I don't see champ, uh, many cross country horses doing in the fact that I don't believe that you can back a horse to win a cross country race, um, unless they've been around the track, because it's just such a unique thing. They can go to the one in France in Powell. Or they can go over to, there's a couple in Ireland at Punchestown um, and get experience. But Cheltenham itself is a unique cross-country track. Um, they can't walk the track, so it was an issue. I, I backed Galvin at 3-1 to one when they, they, the ground was dry and they weren't watering. And since then, all you've heard this week is a lot of people saying Galvin's working very well. The reason Galvin still has a very strong chance is because of the fact that Gordon Elliott has been doing these little sneaky, like Cheltenham school in private sessions. So he's allowed, every year you see photos of his horses, like two, three, four horses, and they're basically they're running a race around the cross-country track. So he's taking Delta Work, Galvin, and a couple of others, and they'll be going around the cross-country track. Set it out like a race, practice on a few areas, and just do it as, and you see the pictures. And when Galvin first came into the picture, he was probably went from 20s into about 60s, and everyone starts saying, no, it's not the same. But those two have got such similar profiles to when Delta Work beat Tiger Roll, to what Galvin has got to coming into this against Delta Work. Like Galvin was fourth in a gold cup last year, sent off ten to three. He's got more than enough class for an event like this. The concern for me would be the cross country track. But the thing was last year, that was the same with Delta Work. I said he couldn't win because he hadn't had the cross country. Obviously he'd only done private schooling. But whatever Elliot's doing on this private schooling is clearly enough that they're getting enough experience that they know where they stand with it. Thing is for Galvin, while he's got he has got form on soft ground and he can win on soft ground, I just think he doesn't improve for it. He enjoys good ground. Um, whereas the difference is if you look at um, Delta Work, Delta Work loves it. So the good thing is it's holding up the price for whoever you want to back. Me personally, obviously, I'm on Galvin at three to one. I'd be pretty surprised if the ground wasn't soft enough or softer. Like if it's soft or soft, worse than soft. Because obviously, just because it says soft on the hurdles and chase track on the Tuesday doesn't mean it's going to be that on the cross country track. So you've got to keep an eye out to see what it is on the cross country track because it takes the water differently. And it also wouldn't have had the same irrigation because the irrigation, obviously, they water, I think they put something like 30 mils down across the track, but they wouldn't have been able to put the same amount down across country. So these could be soft, whereas the cross country might be soft, good to soft right now. And then it could dry out with the wind and then it could be good to soft suddenly. And then it's like a coin toss of who's going to handle it better. Whereas if it's on the soft or worse than soft, then I think it's Delta Works. Um, just because the main thing, as I said last year, with Tiger Roll, I was so keen on him, was the track form. I think if you've got the course experience. I mean, I don't really understand the run and the handicap. Like, he was getting two stone. I thought he'd pot around, do all his bit, and then when his chance was gone, he wouldn't be hard ridden. 
But, I mean, he was, like, pretty much battered to make sure he got into third, which was a very strange run for me because he was hit really hard. Um, obviously, he was he did he came 13 and a half lengths in the Boyne um, behind Blaze and Cow just for a spin recently, what they've used for Tiger Roll, um, just to knock the cobwebs off. Um, and he goes here with a favourites chance at the end of the day. But he, he's grown in price. Like, he's been odds on. He's now five to four, and he's got the, he's got the rain coming for him. So there must be plenty of support for Galvin. I just think if the if the ground is soft or worse, I think you're going to be going towards uh, Delta work. And I really, I'd be shocked if it's not one off the front too, um, taking this. And as much as I've had love for this cross country in the past, I think it was maybe because of the horses like Tiger Roll, whereas obviously I don't like Delta work because of last year. So this is just a pure betting um, perspective. And I think the rest have got plenty to find. Um, the Grand Annual, uh, obviously the fields have only just come through, so I'm not going to run through all of that because I don't have, the only selection I had was Time White, um, but I was banking it on, well, he, he's, he gets comes here nice and fresh. My concern was, well, I thought it was going to be good ground, so I thought this is perfect, good ground, fresh horse. Um, it might well end up good or good to soft in the end. Um, like you looked last year and it was a deluge on the Wednesday, yet come Thursday and Friday, the ground still looked a lot better. Um, it was just the Wednesday itself was atrocious. So for that one, I'll just be waiting um, a little bit longer. Uh, and obviously, I need to go through the whole field now. Now they've all been declared. I obviously put up Andy Dufresne um, about 20 to 1. Didn't back it myself. Um, and now he's favourite. So like obviously, he's well handicapped. He's off the same mark. Um, but he's into 11 to 2 now, which is more than short enough for a horse that's got form figures of fell, third, seventh, eighth. His best run was clearly the second last year, and Gordon Elliott's clearly laid him out for this. Um, but it's now not gone unnoticed, and I didn't back him myself when I mentioned the 20s, so just going to have to wait and see on that one. I'll probably go elsewhere, to be honest, and, and uh, take a risk elsewhere. So on the final race of the day, and it is the Championo bumper. Uh, most people just go and get a beer for this. I absolutely love it. And I also, if, if you can connect one here, what I mean by this is if you can get a horse to win this and then the Supreme or the Bally more the next year, you'll get some really good prices. Like if you can get a bookmaker, say if you were really keen on one, like say Prime would be last year, people may have got Fasal Vega to win last year and then win this year's Supreme. They probably got 25s or 33s. Like I got um, Sir Gerhard the year before to win the champion bumper and then win the Ballymore at 25 to 1. And obviously he was sent off like 8 to 13 or 4 to 6. So it's just, if you can find one in here to do the double, it's perfect. So it's good to look out for for your 2024. And I, I love the bumper. Um, but I'll keep this short. Uh, Willie Mullins is one. I'm going to not just... going to find it for you. Why is that not coming up? Uh, I want to say Mullins has won four of the last five. But I am going to check because I don't want to stand here and tell you lies. So please bear with me for 30 seconds. Champion Bumper, Fasal Vega, Sir Gerhard, Fanny Hollow, Envoy Allen and Relegate. So yeah, as expected, Willie Mullins has won four of the last five and between Gordon Elliott and Willie Mullins, they've won the last six. Elliott's won two and Mullins has won the last four. Um, the, the big sticking point for this is the Future Stars Novice Bumper over in Ireland. So the horses that have um, won that have finished... Let's have a look. Envoy Allen won it and then won here. Uh, I believe Sir, Sir Gerhard won it and then won here. Faso Vega won it and then won here. Um, not sure if Fernie Hollow did. So basically, the winner of that race is a massive form line to here. The winner of this year's Future Stars bumper was A Dream to Share, changed by, uh, trained by John Kiley. He bolted up on the day, in fairness to him. And has since been purchased by JP McManus and has now installed the four to one favourite. For a while he was six or seven to one, went around the preview circuit, and now he's obviously been backed accordingly and he's now favourite. The thing for me is he was getting backed all the time while there's good ground. It's not good ground anymore, it's soft. And it could get worse or it could be around soft. We could get stick reading, it could end up that it's actually good to soft, so it's not too bad at all. But from what I'm seeing at the moment, if it is genuine soft ground, I think it's a negative for him because he just looks a flat horse. He looks like a horse that could be running at Royal Ascot. Um, he just, the way he quickened off the pace at the Dublin Racing Festival, um, he was just held in. He looked exactly like a flat horse. The way he was bucketed in, he had a turn of foot and he went for home. But you hear all the backlash from that. And in second was Factor File. And uh, Connections of Patrick Mullins wanted that ride again. 
Like he just felt that he should have made more of him, more of a stamina test. But I think it was hard to do in the circumstances anyway, just because the way they went, the way the, the race was set up. So Dream to Share has his chance and is uh, is now, thankfully, he is the right favourite because for a while it was it's for me. Um, but I don't think the good ground will help him. Obviously, he's got a favourite's chance, but it's a champion bumper. They've all had two or three runs. So he's not one I'm going to be looking to back. It's for me. Looks very good. Um, Paul Townend's decided to choose to ride him um, of the choice of any of Willie Mullins. So he'll be riding him. And obviously, they could have put Daryl Jacob on him being in the double green. But he's decided he's on It's For Me. Um, this horse went from 25s into the 72, the champion bumper, um, after his debut. The, the dogs were barking, to put it that way. I looked a bit too late. It's, it's rare for me to be behind, but I was. And he was already 10 to 1 before he even ran. And then he was electric in his performance. Um, he beat Sutton's Hill 10 lengths. That horse has finished about 7 lengths behind Western Diego. So there's not a lot between him and Western Diego. And Western Diego is over three times the price. Like as in, so as much as he was visually very impressive, like there's nothing to say that he should be a five to one shot, but it's a champion bumper. Any of these could be a five to one shot. Horse that really interests me and is top of my list, I've got three for this, is Factor File. I thought he'd go a little bit underlooked because of the fact that um he's obviously one of the few that's got a two next to his name rather than all ones, um, because he got beat by a dream to share. But you listen to going into the DRF. Obviously, Mullins has got so many horses he could have entered into that future champions race. And he decided to enter Factor File. Factor File was sent off two to one favourite. Um, and as I said, I don't mean that race will be run anything like this will. Like this will be a few horses will go off in front and then they'll come to the hill and it'll be who can stay. The stamina will win the day. It's not going to be it's not going to be one horse travelling on the bridle and then just snipping and going away like a Queen's Gamble style or Dream to Share when they did it. it it's going to be a, you're going to be off the bridle. I can't, you're going to have to be a superstar basically to win this on the bridle. Like look at Fasal Vega. Yeah, he won it really well, but he still came off the bridle and was pushed out all the way down the hill. And I think factor file, the stamina test will suit and the way people talk about it, it sounds like he's improving chunks between each run. The fact that he's with JP McManus says that he's obviously well thought of at home. And it's just come out this morning. He's still 7-1. to one. He was 8-1 to one when I put it on the blog yesterday. Um, that Patrick Mullins has chosen to ride him of what was left or however they've decided to do it. So the fact he's chosen him of theirs, even though he has been beaten, I think he has got a strong chance. And if you're an H-way backer, he's probably good for that because of the fact that, as I said, he's probably going to stay on. Um, fun, fun, fun. Looked very good. But I just thought that mare's bump was absolutely awful. I think that she'd be perfectly suited, ready for um, Aintree, for the Mayor's Bumper there. She'll give a proper race to, I can't remember what the horse is called. Now You See Me, or In Between Dreams, or I can't remember. Basically, the Paul Nichols horse that bolted up the Mayor the other day. If she goes there, they'll end up having a right showdown. Um, I just think this, like, I'm not sure, even getting the seven pounds, that she's going to be good enough to win this. Like, she was off the bridle miles out in that race and looked well beaten and just stayed on past and one going away. But I just don't rate the race. I mean, she was she bolted up nine lengths from last year's winner, Lily de Burley, but that horse has been well beaten over the hurdle since. And again, it's not really a form. Um, better days ahead. <sighs> Beat Chapeau de Soleil, but I thought Chapeau de Soleil could not have done anything more run wrong so for, of the two because Chapeau de Soleil sat below him I think Chapeau de Soleil will drift so currently priced at 12 to 1 I think obviously a lot of people know I put that up at 16 to 1 start of the season that and Lossy Mouth and Quay de Paris were the talking horse from the Rich Ritchie obviously Lossy Mouth worked out Chapeau de Soleil we don't know and Quay de Paris didn't work out but Chapeau de Soleil is very interesting because they just cannot stop talking about it at home even when they get really good horses winning, they still go back to Chapel de Soleil and say, keep your eye on that one. And he's managed to squeeze in here because obviously he's only had one run and they've risked it. Um, but his ratings still managed to get him in. He's very inexperienced and he's only had that one run and he did everything wrong on that run. He hung. He may as well have been in the rail. The weather was awful. He was out in front too soon. Um, but in the end, he ended up looping the whole field. Like it was, he drifted all the way across the track and you just thought he was going to get pulled up. But then he looped the field, and then when he, once he got once the clog started whirring, and he and, it, and the penny dropped, he really found, and he came back at better days ahead. Um, so it, even if he finds it late, like coming into the bend, he, the clogs might click late. But if they click late enough, even if it's at the top top of the straight, when they come in around the bend, if he can get him going, then he has actually going forwards. 
Like, there's nothing to say that he's not going to find and find and find. And the way they talk about him, he must have plenty of potential. So he's going to be one at a big price. But because of his blowout potential, I think he's going to be a quite. He might end up being a big price on the exchanges and on the day, unless the Mullins yard come from him. But even then, even if he's because he's won schooling bumpers going into his last run, so they knew that he could handle it, um, and he was good for a bumper win. But for whatever reason, on the day in the small field, he was nothing of the sort. But I think he'll be covered up in this and he'll come through the pack rather than from the front. Would I be surprised if he pulled up and he did nothing? No, of course he wouldn't. But at the same time, would I be surprised if he won? No, I wouldn't. So, But I think you'll get paid. You'll get rewarded for your, your price. I think come the day, it wouldn't surprise me if he's 16s or 20s or, or maybe even higher, especially on the exchanges. And Canto Bruno, wise guy horse. He won a couple of bumpers at the, uh, I think, October and November meeting. No, it was the October meeting. He beat strong leader. The form's fairly solid for John McConnell, but it's not me being personal. I just want to stick to the Irish, as in Willie Mullins, Gordon Elliott types. Queen's Gamble flopped a bit last time, but was carrying a penalty. Could bounce back. So we come to my other horse that I like, and that's Western Diego, for the exact same reasons as people are backing it. It's for me, but he's three times bigger the price. Uh, where the hood, he wore a hood on debut, so he's clearly not straightforward, but you wouldn't think that by the way he ran. Like, he was flawless. Straight as an arrow, not not a bother on him. Travelled, just one going away as you liked. Very similar to it's for me, but and in good good sectionals, good times for the race. Um, Rachel Blackmore is going to be aboard, and she's obviously won the champion bumper for Willie Mullins before in the past. Um, and although he's down the pecking order, that would not bother me whatsoever. And again, I just think you're just going to get a good price. So obviously, the factor far would make sense. Probably the money might come for him because of the fact Patrick Mullins is booked. But I think Chapeau du Soleil, who's currently 12s, and Western Diego 16s. Is that right? Yeah, um, it wouldn't surprise me if you got that or at least bigger on the day on the exchanges and on the thing, because this is such a competitive race. Captain Teague, um, I think it was Tom Malone, but some very strong bullish words who's um, for that horse, for Paul Nichols. But it's rare for Paul Nichols to enter one, but I also don't think Paul Nichols puts the gun to the head for these sort of races. And whilst I don't think Millie Mullins does too much either, he just naturally has so many good bumble horses. And the fact that he's obviously won um, three of the last four and four of the last six, like he's just my place to go. So in summary, we've got Factor File, Chapeau du Soleil and Western Diego. And they're all at fair prices. People say, and I don't need to tell you how to back those three if you're trying to make a profit. So let's have a quick run through. Um, Imperio Pass and Hermes Allen in the first. Um, Jerry Colom, standout. Um, San Salvador in the Coral Cup, 20-25 to 1. Edward Stone, unless the, run, unless the rain really gets in. Um, Delta Work, if it's soft, if it's not soft, like as an if goods in the title, then Galvin. Um, the Grand Annual I need to look at still. And in the Champion Bumper, I'm taking on the favourites. And going instead with Factor Far, Chapa du Soleil and Western Diego. So I think Wednesday looks the trickiest day of the um, four um, of the meeting. Um, so therefore, I haven't got an antipost. There might uh, not an antipost, a multiple. I might put one up on my blog because I will be there on the Wednesday. So if anyone sees me, come say hello. Um, but yeah, that, that's it for Wednesday. Let's go. I'm going to record Thursday next. And then that'll be it because I'll be at home on Thursday. So I'll put Fridays up on Thursday night. So good luck and I'll see you all on track.